Okay. So I'd just like to acknowledge this project, uh, which is uh, a fifth year research project of one of the students, uh, uh, John Gina Inwood, uh, from the School of Veterinary Science at UQ. And uh, I'm presenting it today because she's preparing for her exams um, to uh, graduate as a vet student. And just to acknowledge uh, Linda Marsden, who's the other uh, co-supervisor, and Sophie Worley, who's been doing some research uh, work for us. So euthanasia of unwanted pets is the primary cause of death for healthy um, and treatable dogs and cats in developed countries. So these are, this is the most recent statistics that we have for Australia. And this is combined, uh, we've done some extrapolation, so it's council pounds and animal welfare agencies. And if you have a look at the, do I have a pointer here? Are there any, are there any pointers? So I have to go down here, like this. Yep. Okay. So of the 210,000 dogs um, that come into shelters and pounds, um, it calculates out to an intake of about nine dogs per thousand residents and 1.8 and deaths per thousand human residents. Um, and similarly for cats, uh, if we calculate it out, it's about seven cats coming into shelters and pounds around Australia. Um, and that lower number for cats uh, compared to dogs is because quite a few councils don't take cats around Australia. Uh, and the death rate's about 3.8 cats per thousand residents. Um, but if you look at the outcomes of those uh, animals that are coming into the shelters and pounds, for the, the percentage that's rehomed of intake for dogs, it's about 19% and 26% or 27% for cats. We actually look at this statistic next door to that, which, let me just see if I can. Uh, so this is actually a better statistic because so many dogs are reclaimed by the original owner and this actually gives a better uh, indication of activity to find new homes for, uh, can you, you can see my point, yes, new homes for animals. So. Uh, a higher percentage of unclaimed animals have found homes for dogs and cats, but still, you know, quite a, a large number. Then, uh, similar numbers are transferred to other agencies, but the real difference, of course, for cats and dogs is that just under half the dogs are reclaimed by the original owner and only about 4.5% of cats, so every between four and five percent, which is better than U uh, USA, that's between one and two percent. But unfortunately, uh, the bad news for cats is that their euthanasia rate is uh, more than double that for dogs, um, and that's because of that uh, low reclaim rate. And euthanasia comes at a cost. Fifty percent of people that are directly involved with euthanasia will e end up with perpetration-induced post-traumatic stress, and they perceive themselves as perpetrators of the killing. Um, and what that causes is mental health issues, depression, um, it, it, relationship issues can result in suicide. And as far as uh, municipalities are concerned, uh, you may end up with having staff off on stress leave from work, which is quite costly. And in fact, it's been shown that the staff turnover rate in shelters is proportional to the euthanasia rate. So the higher youth erasure rate, the harder it is to keep staff. And of course this has financial, moral and ethical ramifications, not only for the municipality that you're working in, but also the community. And as you know, councils have a mandated responsibility for managing dogs and cats in your communities. In Victoria, each council must produce a domestic animal management plan and have it on their website. And when you do a quick scan of those, some municipalities actually have less than 5% euthanasia for dogs, whereas some have 40 to 55%. And if you look at cats, some of them around 12, 14% euthanasia rates, and quite a lot are between 80 and 95%. So we asked ourselves, you know, what, count, what are the councils with low euthanasia and high live release doing compared to those ones that have got poorer outcomes for animals. So the aim of the study was to identify factors associated with high live release and low euthanasia 
in Victorian municipalities. Why Victoria? Well, for Victoria, each municipality is bound by the Domestic Animal Act and every four years they have to produce a domestic animal management plan which outlines um, how council intends to manage the overpopulation and address the high euthanasia rate for dogs and cats. And every year they're record, required to report annually on the numbers of dogs and cats managed and their outcomes and have that on their website. So we contacted 42 of the 79 councils by telephone, um, invited you to participate. And we're asking for participants to be um, part of the animal management team who had a um, sound knowledge of the council pound protocol and operations. We got a participation rate of 36%. And the questionnaire covered areas of, such as strategies to reduce intake, such as desexing programs, Strategies to increase reclaiming and rehoming, such as registration compliance, microchipping programs, adoption and fostering programs, programs to promote responsible pet ownership. And we also asked about your attitudes to trap, neuter and return and to getting to zero euthanasia of adoptable and treatable animals. We took the data for intake, reclaim, rehome and euthanasia from each council's domestic animal management plan. Um, only 62 out of the 79 actually had analysable statistics. Um, some had none, and one we called up said, oh, it's on our website, but it's just not viewable to the public, um, which I don't think is quite the intention of the act, but anyway. <laughs> and some, you know, have, uh, you know, they just had numbers euthanised and not intake, some had just intake and not um, other stats. So, just to, we um, classified councils based on um, uh, ABS data, and I'm only showing you the data for 13 at this stage, um, because it is a preliminary study, and I wanted to share the findings with you so you can um, take those back to your councils, but also to really encourage you to participate. Because the aim is to identify what will make a difference to you, what are the most effective strategies that you can focus on. Um, not surprisingly, councils uh, with, uh, that were in cities had higher populations. What is, was interesting that um, shires had almost double the number of dogs per thousand human population that cities did. Um, but there were similar numbers for cats. And quite large um, proportion of cats uh, registered then, um, just a bit under half for cities. So the good news for dogs, and that was really quite a revelation to us when we worked, worked, worked through these statistics, that nearly 40% of councils have live release rates for dogs that are 90% or higher, with euthanasia rates of 10% or lower. And that's a widely quoted statistic um, that represents, <laughs> said to be representing zero euthanasia of treatable and releasable animals. Now, probably councils, because they get such a proportion of animals that are reclaimed by the original owner um, and looking at the data, um, probably 5% uh, represents uh, the number that is possible to get down to. And when we talk about treatable, those are animals that from a welfare perspective can be treated, releasable, that are releasable to the community um, and not a danger to the community. And so when we looked at, and we're going to talk, I'm talking a little bit about quartiles, the top quartile of pounds, they have achieved euthanasia rates of 7% of less uh, for dogs and uh, live release rates of 93% or more. But the not so good news is that some in, well the bottom quartiles, so that's the bottom 25% of those 62 that we could get data from have euthanasia rates up to 55% for dogs, so every second dog that comes in. The news for cats is not so good um, and the top quarter of performers, of those 62 performers, had euthanasia rates of 43% or less, which translates to a live release of 57%. But um, the bottom quarter, so the bottom 25% of those 62, have euthanasia rates between 85 and 95% with only 5 to 15 per cent released alive. When we looked at operation type, um, 
more transferred immediately to an animal welfare agency. Um, a smaller percentage were full service, so they both um, did reclaim and rehome. And what the others that we called hold only, where they held them for the minimum holding period and then transferred them to an animal welfare agency. <coughs> and the agencies predominantly that were being transferred to were the Lost Dogs Home and the RSPCA. Interestingly, only 22% um, who transferred had KPIs written into the contract. And they were largely related to the requirement for the, um, the agency to vaccinate and microchip uh, animals that were being released. And they didn't uh, refer to outcomes for the animals otherwise. We looked at impact of operation on the percentage of dogs euthanised. And there was no difference between pound operation for percent of dogs euthanised. So very similar, um, about 11, 10 to 11%. Um, and there were no significant differences between city and shire, which was actually interesting. And uh, uh, so that you can see that the euthanasia percents there. However, for cats, there was a significant difference between pound operation. So the full service ones were achieving uh, euthanasia rates that were nearly half those where the animals were going to uh, um, welfare agencies. And unfortunately, that, that was largely because of the, animal, the cats that were going to uh, the lost dog's home. And uh, so those ones that were up around 80, 90% uh, of cats being euthanised were the ones uh, through the lost dog's home. And there was no big di difference in demographics between uh, euthanasia rates for cities and shires, which is, was actually interesting to see. Now, this uh, graph here, I'd just like to um, walk you through. So the red line here uh, is the death rate um, or the numbers of cats killed. And these are North American statistics uh, from a, um, a pound. And here's the cat intake. And this is for dogs, again, euthanasia rate and uh, intake. And this, comes, this quote comes from Peter Marsh's book, which is a fascinating book to read um, about uh, replacing myth and math using evidence-based programs to eradicate shelter overpopulation. And what he said was that the drop in shelter euthanasia rates over the past 30 years has been produced almost exclusively by a decline in shelter intake. So that's really important to realise that strategies that you implement as municipalities to decrease in intake can have the most powerful effect on reducing euthanasia. So we asked questions about what sort of strategies did councils have about desexing programs. And uh, in North America, targeted, low cost or even free desexing does reduce dog and cat intake, where it's targeted to areas that you know where you've got high intakes. And if you're not keeping postcodes, you should be, so that you know where your problem areas are. But generally, um, it is the areas that are lower socioeconomic. San Jose had a 50% drop in shelter intake using spay neuter voucher program, and it saved the county $1.5 million over four years. Now, um, voucher programs are often shown not to be effective. In this case, they made sure they made appointments for the people with the vouchers. Because they were targeting low socioeconomic, they followed them up, they called them up every week to make sure that, you know, because a lot of these people don't even have transport to get into them. So they offered free transport in some cases. They called them the day before to make sure they were coming in. So they had very high compliance rates with these vouchers um, and very often they were free. Now this is some data which I wish Blacktown would publish. Um, Norm Blackman told me about it and they had a, um, a, a, a a subsidised scheme where they um, were subsidising desexing by 50% in the uh, area of the council. And they got Deloitte's, the big accounting firm, to come in. And Deloitte's estimated that for every $100 that they spent in the community subsidising, desexing and promoting it, saved them $200 from the decreased entry into the, into the pound. Um, and what they had, and the cost associated with that. And when they actually looked at it, they had decreased ranger complaints, decreased call outs, and when they added those factors in, they said for every hundred dollars 
they spent in the community, Deloitte's estimated it cost, it saved them three to four hundred dollars in the pound operation and in their um, animal management operation. So it's, it's powerful figures and, and um, it would be great if it, it got out into the literature. Um, when we asked about desexing programs, um, about uh, a third did run subsidised desexing, but it was very ad hoc. They might have run one, um, and two of them uh, were involving rescue groups, and those rescue groups got grants. Um, so they were sort of one off, two off grants to run a desexing program. So they were not continuous. Um, about a third had an awareness of the AVA voucher. Um, but only uh, very few distributors, only one, and the comment was it was so cumbersome it just wasn't worth their labour to try and do this. So um, that needs to be addressed to make it much easier to use. And when we asked um, later in the survey about where people thought efforts should be focused to reduce euthanasia, 42% of respondents suggested desexing programs for dogs and 58% felt that desexing programs for cats would be really beneficial. So more felt it was beneficial for cats and in fact um, studies from overseas uh, show that it is effective for dogs but it's much more effective for cats. And that's probably because if we, um, when we analysed the data for uh, RSPCA right across Australia, um, and I've just done a survey, uh, another uh, data analysis for dogs in Queensland, and you know it's between about uh, 10 to 20 per cent of dogs coming into RSPCAs are puppies, whereas for cats it's over just over half the cats coming in are kittens. And that's probably why desexing programs make more impact for cats, because dogs more often have a home and then they lose it, whereas cats, those kittens just, there are just too many kittens. So being cognizant of the fact that reducing intake is so powerful, we asked about how, what, what were they doing to get the animal directly back to the owner without coming into the pound. 91% did return the animal directly if it had a current registration tag and microchip. Um, but there was some discretion if the, person was, if the dog was a serial offender in getting out. And, um, if the pound was at capacity, a few actually did return the dog if it was identified and they could contact the owner, um, if it didn't have current registration and then they followed that up. Um, two actually offered pound facilities for people to temporarily hold the animals and one of it was free while they fixed their fences um, or got some sort of containment system for the animal, which was um, quite impressive. When we asked about attempts to slow um, numbers coming in when they were nearing at capacity, uh, some would uh, contact volunteers and rescue groups and put the word out to the community that they really needed help, they were nearly full. They advised surrendering owners that you know, they were full and they couldn't take them. Um, and some of them did uh, return unregistered dogs directly to the owner and followed up with registration um, there. So then we looked at strategies to increase live release. And when we talk about live release, we mean, we mean reclaim, rehomed, and actually transferred to rescue groups because most of those find homes. In the data that um, is up on the Victorian government websites or on the municipal websites, uh, the transferred ones are largely uh, classed under rehome. So you've got re reclaim and rehome statistics up there. And euthanasia is just the intake minus those that uh, are reclaimed and rehomed. And when we looked at the top councils for live release for dogs, so that is the councils that are achieving over 93% of dogs back out into the community, most of those, three quarters of those, had reclaim rates in the top quartile as well, in the top 25%. So they had 80% or more of dogs that were reclaimed by the original owner. And when we looked at the pounds that had the lowest live release rates, most of those, so 64%, were also in the lowest quartile for reclaimed by the original owner. So they had less than 54% of dogs reclaimed by the original owner. So it appears that high reclaim rate is associated with low euthanasia and high live release. 
So we asked about what strategies um, people were doing to uh, assist reclaim, and particularly um, with microchipping. And last year, a student of mine, um, Emily Lancaster, did a study with the RSPCA, and we looked at dogs and cats coming into RSPCA Queensland shelters around Queensland. And only 28% of dogs that were stray that were coming into the shelter had a microchip, and 9% of stray cats. But 39% of those, or 37% that had a microchip, the data was incorrect. Um, and in fact, some of them were uh, not even registered, about 14% were not registered, which is illegal. And we looked at reclaim rates, um, and they were obviously significantly higher if the microchip had accurate contact details. And so we asked um, who was running microchip events. And so about five of the councils that we surveyed were running microchip events. So that was you know, uh, discounted microchipping, microchip awareness, um, and those sorts of programs. We asked about registration compliance, and everyone door knocked, but it was on, um, most of it was on <coughs> an um, ad hoc basis. And so, and I'd just like to emphasise how important it is that we get more participants so we can help you tell you what part of compliance really is effective to put your time into. Some used microchip database, uh, so they'd go to the microchip database and find out what animals in their municipality were on the database but were not registered, um, and then contact them. Some used SMS and email, so that when um, the registration came due and it wasn't registered, they'd send out an email or SMS alert to the owner to say, you know, your dog needs to be registered, which I think is, is great. Um, one council had a 24-hour uh, hot, hotline for owners to be able to report a lost pet, and that then sent out emails immediately to the rangers to notify them about the details of the pet that was lost so they could be on the alert for it. When we then looked at strategies to get animals out and adoption, the ones that had the highest live release rates worked with multiple rescue groups in the community to try and find homes for them. Um, and one of them worked with up to 50 groups. So obviously, you know, this is really um, relevant for the full service ones, um, but uh, three quarters ran adoption programs, the other um, relied on foster carers and rescue uh, organisations to find homes. And that, um, talking to some of the rescue groups, they really just feel overwhelmed uh, and it's never ending, that tide of animals. So uh, they, you know, they're very passionate, they're very motivated to make a difference, but they've got, they're basically um, doing the council's work to find homes for these animals. Some had designated adoption areas, so they had a room or rooms set up like a house with a couch where you could bring down your own pets, you could interact with the pet that you thought you'd like to, to adopt, and they made it you know, easy so you could see how the animal was you know, uh, in, a, in a house type situation and how it was with the pet. Most had foster programs and when we asked them about them, uh, the effectiveness of them, what they told us was that they thought they were very effective for behaviour modification, those timid dogs, those anxious dogs, those ones that were unruly, that had had no training, didn't sit, didn't walk on a lead properly. Um, and also for rehoming, because those uh, foster carers are out in the community telling people about the animals, and so it provides an, a, a wonderful opportunity for uh, rehoming. And in fact, uh, at the Getting to Zero conference that Mel was at, uh, Mel organised, and I wish um, all of you were there because it was absolutely inspiring. And some of the things I was talking about was that instead of um, making you know, it really cumbersome so people who wanted to adopt an animal had to go to the foster carer's place, look at the animal, then come back to the pound and fill out the paperwork and pay, why not make those foster carers part of your sort of organisation so they could process the animal and they could take it straight away? And it's about getting animals out into the community and not putting up whole lots of barriers. Because people will, the, the message was, people will get an animal if they want it. If you make it difficult, 
they'll get it from somewhere else. So why not get them an animal that you've you know, assessed and, and hopefully microchipped and ideally is desexed as well? Um, most advertised in local newspapers, one even advertised on t local TV, which is fantastic. And you know, the important thing is, is that you need to be seen as a preferred source. If you're doing behavioural testing, you're saying that the animal's healthy, you should be seen as a preferred source of an animal rather than just you know, off Gumtree or somewhere like that where there's no control. So you're competing as a source of animals and that's how you need to be shown. As, you know, you've got great animals that are available for adoption. Uh, some actually uh, accepted, none accepted donations of money to help them from uh, the ones that we talked to, but some accepted donations of food and bedding and toys. They involved the community. They had work for the doll people coming down and walking the dogs and socialising the cats. Correctional services people coming down, helping with training. Um, volunteer programs including with school kids, um, TAFE students, and they ran community education seminars um, and school educational visits. When we asked about uh, views on zero euthanasia, and uh, when we talk about zero euthanasia, we're talking about treatable and releasable animals. So as you know, there is a percentage of dogs in the community that are, that are not safe. They're dangerous dogs and, and we're not talking about those. And actually, I think it would be great when you put on your statistics on your website, you actually identify those, that number that are dangerous dogs. So the community knows that. Because I think the community accepts that, most people in the community accept that if a dog's a dangerous dog, um, then the, the safe thing to do is to euthanise it. Um, so we asked the respondents what they believed that their council could, or could um, or we asked them about their zero euthanasia, and more response, uh, respondents believed that their council could in the future rehome all treatable, and I've got adoptable dogs there because that's what we actually asked rather than releasable. Um, and uh, it was 58% for dogs and 25% of cats. And 33% of respondents believed that the large number of cats made it impossible to ever achieve zero euthanasia. And when we asked about how long did people think it would take to get to zero euthanasia, and um, this was quite interesting, that 33% um, uh, said less than 10 years, and they actually commented that um, three quarters of the full service facilities um, believed they were already rehoming all suitable dogs, and when we looked at their euthanasia rates, yes, they were. That 5% or less, quite remarkable. 50% of the um, full service operations believed they were rehoming all suitable dogs, uh, suitable cats, rather, and they had euthanasia rates of 21 and 28%. And that highlights the issue that not all cats are suitable for finding another home for, and we need to find other strategies uh, that uh, are suitable you know, to, to address cats. And uh, sadly, I think 42% of uh, respondents felt they would never get to that for dogs, um, and 67% for cats. And when we asked about um, uh, trap, neuter and return, uh, and we talked to them, we gave them a little preamble and said that you know, it has been shown overseas where it's targeted. And when we mean trap, neuter and return, we mean going out to those areas where you know that there's uh, animals, cats uh, particularly, coming in to your pound um, that are not, you know, they're, they're not really rehomable. They're poorly socialised. Uh, people are trapping them, you're trapping them, and, um, and then you know, the, the, the uh, euthanasia rate is very high with those. And we, we didn't give them data um, from overseas, but in fact uh, data from overseas shows that when it's targeted to those areas, you can get a 30, uh, 36 to 66% decline in shelter intake. Um, you can get up to an 87% decline in euthanasia because they are the ones that are being mostly, you know, their euthanasia rates are often 100%. And interestingly, they got a decline in cat-related complaints, which was, and that was quite um, 
there was a number of uh, uh, councils that reported that in North America. And so when we asked people about that, um, it was actually interesting. Uh, and I was quite surprised at the um, number that nearly a third, uh, it was a bit over a quarter, uh, were positive, gave positive comments about uh, their view about trap, neuter and return and, and uh, 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 introducing it. Many mentioned wildlife um, impacts even if the cats are neutered and 27% uh, mentioned that the large number of cats would prevent any effectiveness. Um, and I guess you can see that 64% uh, were very negative about it. And in my talk after the break, uh, when I talk about strategies, uh, we'll go into a lot more arguments about pros and cons for trap, neuter and return. So when we looked at the pounds with high live release strategies, um, they, it wasn't just one strategy, they were using multiple strategies um, to decrease intake, they had desexing programs, they returned directly to the owner, um, they used SMS, email reminders, microchipping to get um, high reclaim rates and they really, um, what really characterised them, they had a very strong community approach. They worked with rescue groups, they had good adoption areas, they used volunteers, foster programs to get those animals out into the community. And they used advertising. Now, of course, the limitation of this study is that we only had 36% um, of the people we invited to uh, participate and the invitations weren't, um, it was just uh, random. Um, and only 19% of that 79 uh, municipal councils in Victoria. So clearly it can lead to bias and in fact uh, when we looked at it, it is biased to better outcomes because our respondents had uh, a lower state average euthanasia rate for dogs um, compared to cats. And so um, the recommendations are that come out of this study, I think legislation should be changed to allow you to directly return um, animals that are, uh, where the owner can be a, a contacted, to return them if they're not registered and allow you to provide um, some uh, requirement that they need to register them within a certain number of days. And obviously, if it's not desexed, uh, you, know, you might have to give them 21 days so they can get the lower desex rate and have it desexed. You might be providing with a voucher as well. Remember, a lot of these um, people clearly the people that don't have their animal registered, don't have them desexed, uh, they do come from uh, more challenging environments often. But what's been really interesting data from North America shows that people that are low socioeconomic actually have a stronger bond with their animal than people from high socioeconomic families. And, and they're struggling in many areas of their life. And if you can help them keep that animal, help them repair the fence, work out, you know, registration, provide, find, you know, get in contact with Nell and the um, uh, subsidised desexing program that you've got. So there's all sorts of ways of helping these people. But when um, surveys have been done and asked people that were surrendering animals, if those obstacles to them keeping it like behaviour or, you know, fencing or neighbours' complaints could be overcome, would they keep the animal? And over 80% say yes. So you can help them keep them. And just remember, some of those people are struggling in many other areas of their life. And you know, I listened to a talk where someone said, look, if you don't know where you're going to be able to get food for your kids, like your ha you, you're functioning in other areas is poor, you know, you, you can't be thinking about how you're going to fix the fence for the dog. You're just not functioning well. But that doesn't mean that that animal doesn't have a loving home. Um, implement targeted desexing programs to decrease cat and dog admissions. <coughs> Make it easy for pet owners to have correct identification registration. Most people have no idea uh, what the pets um, uh, registration, uh, uh, what, what their microchip number is, which company they're even registered with. So SMS, email, microchipping days, microchipping awareness days. And Rick, I think you're sending out email reminders now, are you? Yeah, annual email reminders, telling the people um, exactly what's recorded on the database and giving them the opportunity to um, modify, um, change owner, update details and what have you. Yeah. 15,000 a week out. 
Great Terrific. So, you know, and it's initiatives like that, and you can help people. You know, you can have those awareness days. You can have, you know, and, and with a rescue, you know, rescue groups and volunteers and the animal welfare agencies. So people can come down on Saturday morning to the local park, they can have their animals scanned, they can find out what microchip company it's with, they can see whether the details are up to date, they can update it there, they can get a de discounted microchip if it doesn't have one in it. So, um, and re increasing rehome, clearly the ones that were working closely with rescue groups had the highest uh, 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 result or highest live release. And promoting a community approach, fostering rehabilitation um, volunteer programs. I haven't shown you all of the data, we asked quite a lot of questions and if people are interested in taking the questionnaire, um, you, know, you can fill parts of it out and then, um, then we can contact you on the phone and get the, the rest of it. But we did ask about pet shops, um, one of them was rehoming through a pet shop. Uh, most of them had not thought about it um, or were not in favour of it. But just increasing your distribution does help and it's better it's got, the pet shop's got your animals in it than some puppy farm animals. And you know, I actually was really encouraged by this data. I think you know, Victorian pounds could get to zero euthanasia in the next five years for dogs. Nearly 40% already have live release rates of more than 90%. Counseling running their own pounds often have better outcomes for cats, but we need more data to be sure of that. But clearly cats need an alternative strategy to decrease intake and increase live release rate to get to zero euthanasia. And I'd encourage you to come to Sarah Zito's talk, who's sitting here, um, who's going to talk about some of the challenges uh, uh, about the community and those, an and those cats. And I'd really congratulate the Victorian Government um, on their initiative so that there is mandated reporting of dog and cat outcomes. Um, they're the only state uh, that have that sort of transparency. And it does enable councils to monitor their progress, how to compare, track themselves with other councils um, and to share effective strategies. And it does help to guide you on the resources that are needed and where they should be targeted to improve the outcomes for dogs and cats. So I'd really like to thank you who um, have participated. Um, we really, really need more participants so we can be, we, have, we can't do statistical analysis yet because we don't have enough to be sure to say to you, well, these things that Pounds are doing are statistically associated with higher live release rates, so think about implementing them. Um, and uh, it's anonymous, so uh, you know, and we need to, we actually need to interview those people who have poorer outcomes so we can see what the difference is. You know, what are, what are you, perhaps you're not doing? And because if everyone's doing, like the um, uh, uh, compliance and door knocking, if everyone's doing it, it doesn't help. But if we can really see what aspects of it and, and what aspects are done by that top quartile and what aspects are being done by the bottom quarter, it gives us more confidence. So that's Georgina. Some of you might have been contacted by Georgina, who's studying hard at the moment to uh, become a, to pass her final exams. Um, and they're my contact details. I will um, have copies of the questionnaire uh, available in the break if you're interested.